What is up, down, and sideways? You beautiful creatures of this beautiful planet, Eric and Mark here with you for a little week. Ape, eight, not ape. There are some apes, not quite on this list though. They're just outside of the top twenty. It's week eight global power rankings. Definitely some movement on the bottom half, and even some big shifts happening in the top five this weekend with those Titan Titanic matchups. No section of the top 20 is immune to the changes that are going on as we go move through this year in League of Legends. As we've laid out, we've got the LCS closing out the, their spring split, getting through into playoffs, LCK, LPL in that type of territory, close to that one as well, and the LEC, they're already getting started on their next split. At the very edge of this list, I'm not sure, I was going back and forth. Between two LPL squads, it was Weibo and LNG to fill out this spot. Weibo squeaks out a win versus EDG. LNG gets the upset against IG, but it was a bit of a smolder effect for Gala. Winning that game, they had no business. So both squads, I'm putting 20, 20A, and 20B. I'm not sure either deserve top 20, truthfully. I like that we've gotten enough weeks into Smolder's ex ex existence that we can call it the Smolder effect when a team got 25 so pentas already. Oh man, it, it, it didn't come onto the scene right away, making those alarms the way that Zeri and you know Aphelios 200 years were coming on through. But we're starting to see those signs from Mr. Smolder, and that's a big one that you're talking about is that LNG uh, upset victory over IG. But yes, it is Weibo holding on to this spot and. By the slimmest of margins against EDG in game three, they're managing to stay through and keep this uh, back end stop for the top 20. Thankfully for them, EDG has a terrible Baron call. Well, it's not terrible. It's 5v4. They just don't play it well. Uh, Fisher ends up TP in a way for some reason, and Weibo wins the fight to secure the game uh, and move to back to a 500 record. LNG is just behind that. SK, a near 3 0 start means they get a return to the top 20 obviously lec you'll see the rankings a little tricky because we're into split two so you're going off of their spring records but you still got to include obviously the power level from winter which is why mad lions are still on this board yeah and it, it's going to be always one of these little hurdles that you got to go through to include the lec given that it's on a bit of a different path and schedule compared to all the other major regions that doesn't mean you get to skip out on teams like SK getting their spot here towards the bottom end. I think players like uh, Niski, very underrated. I don't know what the community really dislikes against him or maybe, you know, some of these underperformances in bigger moments, sure. But he has always come through throughout this regular season and he has been a big part as a veteran player for this SK team. The LCS squads here, first ones on the list, Cloud9, a not super impressive 2 and one it means they stay put, but you gotta reward 100 Thieves for the 3-0, so they leapfrog over C9. Obviously, we got that head-to-head, -head best of five coming up between them to kick off playoffs. Most people are gonna favor Cloud9, but the series, based on spring levels, should be much closer than people are anticipating. I think there obviously is going to be the favoritism towards Cloud9. I think a lot of people are looking at that lineup just in general and trusting the power of these players to carry them through in a best of a five scenario uh, situation. And then when you move over to the side of 100 Thieves, you do got to give that credit, as you mentioned, for what they did successfully throughout this split for the LCS and where they finished it out. And now it's time for playoffs. And we're looking at this matchup between these two getting that stack up right out, right out of the gate. If you're 100 Thieves, you got to convince yourself that all you need to do, win one game. One game at a time. Win one, that's fine. Move to the next one, and then it's still the same goal type of situation. Because if you're looking at this one as, oh, we got to get all three in one go type of thing, you might not think that you got it against a squad like Cloud9 and what they could do in a best of situation. We're all, I think, just waiting for Cloud9 to reach that potential that we expect with this roster. But listen... There's a chance they just don't. It doesn't all of a sudden click in playoffs and they might have an early exit. Playoffs, everyone's at the same starting line, right? You're all starting from the same spot when you're getting to it and trying to reach that finish line at the end of it. If Cloud9 is not able to accelerate to their top speed, which we believe, of course, top speed, top power, all much more so than the other teams in the region, they can't accelerate to that point. 
what's its value compared to a squad like 100 Thieves that is able to do more with what they have and what they've been able to get so far? A couple of LPL squads that have been heading in complete opposite directions the last few weeks. The fall continues for NIP down another handful. I know they... St- I'm not even going to call it stopping the bleeding. They 2-0 Thunder Talk Gaming. Okay, great. But their drop-in series before that, three out of four now, uh, they've fallen down. Whereas World Elite, fresh off a win against uh, Weibo. You're feeling better about WE right now than you are NIP. I think this is a, a kind of a swip swapping of labels is what I'll call these two and where their positions are moving through these power rankings because what we see from WE is a team that is, again, shedding that dark horse label and moving into contender status. And I think that what we can look at with NIP, where they pushed all the way at their peak towards contender status, now you got to knock them down to say, Dark Horse is your goal for trying to be in the playoffs and trying to be someone that can be disruptive. It's to be that, I think, that shift now that we're looking at because WE certainly have proven throughout their strength of schedule, their performances, that they are going to be a team that can contend through that middle to top tier of the LPL. Ninjas in pajamas, unfortunately, this slide has proven that they are not at that t- tier. And the last series for WE, we were seeing Prince back in the lineup. Hadn't been in the last few. Excited. Listen, we still, I'm still rooting for this guy because he was so likable, such a character in the LCS. So hopefully he can find some success again with this WE squad. Would love to see that. I think uh, the way things played out with FlyQuest, not all individually on him. Sure, there's part of that blame of how things didn't, uh, you know, st- finish out the way that it started type of thing for that FlyQuest team. But this is a very young player still when you're looking throughout his career and what we had seen from him in the LCK before. Lots of potential to deliver and excite out there on the Rift. Can't wait to see some more of it with WE. And his former squad bumps up a few in that FlyQuest roster. But if they want to be hovering or sniffing around the top 10, uh, get really any higher than where they are at 12, it's got to be a dominant, convincing playoff run starting with a series win against TL. Starting with that series wins against TEL and an impressive performance from the bottom lane, I think is where we're looking for and wanting to see in a best of scenario to give that boost to this FlyQuest squad because players like Whippo, Inspired, heck, even Jensen in the mid lane, throw him in there. They have been phenomenal for them this year and really have risen to the task and risen to the occasion as these veterans, as these expected players, as even players returning Whippo, Inspired from that time away from the main stage. This has been great from FlyQuest, but it is, needs that young bottom lane to fully get that firepower up to the same or close enough level with the rest of this team to capitalize and keep leapfrogging up this list. It was a carefully calculated dose of easy scheduling for KT Rolster to... They've, they've pumped the brakes. They maybe even stopped the Rolster coaster, got off, fixed the tracks, made sure the cart was in good condition. They go 2-0 to kind of take a deep breath, reset. They seem to look much more comfortable, and it helps when you're playing Nogshim and Firex in back-to-back series. Yes, that is that is part of it. I will give credit over again, as, as I mentioned before, with Nogshim. They've been pushing people that are obviously even performing better than KT to that three game limit in the in the LCK. So got to give them a little bit of a shout out. And then the shout out goes on to BDD. As I already talked about it yesterday when we we're doing our regional power rankings, you got to give them props because I've been harping on my boy. I've been dogging on him for this time with KT on this extended slide that his performance A, wasn't good enough and B, that he was going to be the ticket out of this slide for KT Rolster, that if he improved his performance, if he was more clutch, that this team would find a factor to get towards this victory. What happens this week? He's playing phenomenal on the Oriana, making the big shockwave plays, making it happen for KT. On the other side of that board, starting with top 10, it's a similar theme to KT because D-plus ascends back into top 10. They had the same schedule as KT, also taking down Nongshim and Firax, and then obviously kicked off this week with a series against T1. We were feeling very good about them the last few weeks, you know, seven game win streak coming into that T1 matchup. And listen, both game one and game two, the early game looks great for D+. They just don't know what to do post 20 minutes. 
Yeah, and I think that this is one of those ones where it's an unfortunate uh, opportunity for D plus to refocus. I think this was one of those ones where maybe you built up a little bit of momentum. You see T1 on the schedule, you get excited, you get that hype, and you start to realize, okay, we can put together a good performance against T1. We capitalize on that. All of a sudden, we're leapfrogging into that tier. We're thinking about contending with the T1s, with the Gen Gs. We can be a disruptor for them. I think that goal needs to shift down towards that Hanwha life zone, right? Where you're aiming for that 3-4 and being a strong 3-4 there, where maybe you're able to pull off that type of upset. I think the straight up head-to-head, -head, the way that we saw it right here, was not going to work out for d -Plus. And we're still seeing some of the growing pains from Lucid getting caught out. That's been his biggest issue throughout the whole split is just being in a spot he shouldn't be. We know this guy's mechanics are absolutely insane. We know the mechanics across the board for D plus are insane, which were highlighted in this T1 series. Uh, but yeah, fighting around objectives, when to flip Baron against Darrell, and then of course, Aiming's positioning was also a little off this series. A little is being mighty generous is what I will say about this one. Aiming is, is one of these guys that, you know, one of my favorite ADCs that we've been keeping track of. Someone that I know has the potential to pop off and be a big time damage dealer. He also has the potential to ruin things for your squad in a game where you are really close, where it is a volatile state, where you are not so far out of it and let it be a major advantage for the other team. And that's what you saw in this series, specifically in game one was a big problem with it. And I don't know if it needs to be, you know, kind of a, a realization, a dawning that, okay, maybe I'm very similar to Jackie Love. How does Jackie Love find success on that borderline? Well, sometimes it's about Jackie Love knowing that limit himself very well. And a lot more often it's about that support, having that leash, having that control over him and keeping him in line. I don't think Kellen and Aiming have quite developed that type of chemistry yet or even are the same type of style of players to be able to uh, fulfill that. And we'll see if, you know, we've seen Kellen get subbed out before for Bible. Other squads, we'll see if maybe a shot calling type of change is something that D-plus needs uh, to shore up those mid to late games. Uh, IG stand put in the nine spot despite getting upset by LNG. Nobody would have called that an upset at the start of the year, but honestly, they were in control that game three, and it just boiled down to, well, LNG had Smolder, and they didn't. Gala picks up the hey. pentakill. 25 pentas for this baby dragon, man. It, it, it's picking up quick, man. It's picking up quick. We got to keep track of this one. Keep it under wraps. The Smolder technology getting out of hand. Yes, Smolder and Gala, pretty, pretty good pairing for that game through to make sure that it is LNG coming away from it. It's nothing that's really poured any major concerns of cold water on what we're seeing from IG. I think this is one of those ones where we're seeing LNG rise up a little bit more so to power level that they should have been at and should have been able to compete at for the split. And that's, that's really the takeaway from this one for IG. And uh, the takeaway for Hanwha Life, they get smashed by Genji, bounce back against the bros, survive against Kwang Dong. Not really enough or anything to punish them, but they move down a spot because we got to put the respect on Bun plus Phoenix. We've been talking about Milky Way absolutely nonstop, but respect to this team as a whole. Their last couple of weeks, the last five games, they've beaten Top Esports, Ninjas in Pajamas, Weibo Gaming, they lost the competitive 0-2 to BLG, and then they beat JDG. That is that is the gauntlet of the LPL, and they've won four of five. Oh, you love to see that FPX going it up. This is fantastic because we talked all about, all the way through, about this rise and the heat that was building up for an FPX squad, and then you get this gauntlet. And no boy, oh boy, have they proven that that heat was for real, that they are gonna be here and they're gonna matter when things go into equations for the LPL playoffs. Milky Ways, yeah, you've heard us talk about him quite a bit and that has been fantastic. That has been the spark that has gotten it all going for the team. But you're right, you gotta you gotta give credit over to the other players and what has been going on. I think Shallow Who up in the top side has been someone that hasn't gotten maybe quite enough credit or attention to how well he's been playing and how solid he has been for the team is something you got to keep track of. And, a, and in a landscape like the LPL and the top lane monsters that exist out there, like Mr. 369, the top esports, you got to be careful. And, you know, FPX opposite of D+, they're playing the map well. They're playing it smart. I assume a lot of that is, 
I guess the communication of life and Doc Tom with the Rutsa squad is working pretty well because it's rare that you see this these five guys not being on the same page. Sometimes Kerr is getting caught out doing his own little thing. But everyone else, for the most part, seems on the same page for this FPX squad. G2 remains in that sixth spot. I feel like it's still the highest we've ever had them, and that's because... It's been a little more fluctuating, this 6 to 10 zone, and it really feels like the top 5 is the absolute gatekeeper, but G2 is sitting pretty in that B tier. Yeah, for, for the top team of the LEC, yes, this is good, and I think this is one where I'd, I'd be way more hyped than excited if maybe the execution on the Monday was a little bit cleaner from G2. They just wanted the to give K-Corp something to cheer about, you know? Yeah, okay, well, I'll go with that one. They were feeling the fan vibes all right yeah. in the LEC studio. Uh, you would maybe like a little bit cleaner, but overall, you're still seeing that power level. You're still seeing what you know and are established for G2, and you can have confidence in that level of, of you know skill and what they're going to deliver out on the rift is one of those big positives that you're looking at about for a team like G2 at this spot in the rankings. Into the VIP section. It's the familiar top five, but with a little bit of a shift. But JDG and TES are standpoint. JDG had uh, that loss to FPX, but of course the body of work, not enough to knock them out of the top five. But we get this marquee showdown this week. Top Esports versus JDG and TES should be the favorites heading into that matchup. Number one, I think JDG is on alert, though, for the rest of these contenders in that 6-10 zone to see if any one of them can challenge and swoop in for that top five spot is one of those things that we got to keep track of. And then, yes, Hop Esports moving on through Mr. 369, or as I already talked about, and how much of a monster he can be in the LPL and what a job he has done slotting right into this lineup for top esports and how impactful he has been. Problem is... We're looking at number three, and oh boy, that's a different team at number three wow. than we've seen for the last couple of weeks, wow. Eric. That is T1 oh occupying God. slot number. Three. The lowest ranking T1 has had in all of 2024, all the way down to three. Obviously, that is in large part due to getting 2 0 smackdowned by Gen G. Follow that up. Yes, they 2-0 D+, but both the early games were a little shaky. We're starting to see a little bit of weaknesses in the armor of T1, especially in that early laning phase, and just relying on completely outplaying their opponents, which T1 does nine times out of ten. Yeah, not a not the worst strategy, but it is not a flawless strategy. Is one of those ones that you got to examine for T1. Yes. They were beaten down so handily, so brutally by Gen G that they get knocked all the way down from two to three in this situation. And where we're looking in the VIP room, it's one of those ones where you're just looking at the team and talking about this one. I'm looking at Zeus up in that top side, not his obviously his individual performances type of thing, but this is one of those ones where you're looking at statistics and you're saying, okay, this man is 11 and 0 on the A trucks. So number one. Who is letting him get Aatrox 11 times already when you're seeing this win record at perfection? Number two, you throw in Cassante into that mix and it goes up to 17 and 0 type of territory. Then we start to think about, well, where are these losses coming from? And then it's all these other champions. And that's not to say that he is not proficient on any of these other champions. He's certainly not being able to take advantage of his skill set on these champions the way that he is on the busted Aatrox on the Cassante, and I feel like you maybe even it, it, with the way things are going in this meta, you'll throw a Renekton into that mix type of thing for T1. No real alarm bells type of situation, but absolutely a got to hit the drawing board, retry type of, pick yourself back up and get back at it after that loss to Genji. And I've already seen people saying, oh, we're worried about T1 at MSI, right? An international event. We're not going that far. So let's set, that just feels like fear from previous iterations of MSI coming through again. Still feeling very good about them. I mean, BLG climbing ahead of them is just BLG continues to do BLG things. I know it was a competitive 2-0 against FPX, but it's still five series in a row that they've won 
that should be the takeaway really here. Number one is that obviously there's consequence to losing to Gen G in such a fashion for T1. And number two, that BLG has done enough to usurp a T1 that is slipping down with a situation like that. And what we have seen from this top level squad in the LPL, oh baby, how could you not be excited about what we're shaping up for at MSI with them representing China this is phenomenal what we have with this team night in the mid lane, of course. But the big one that I think has gone under the radar with how things are with BLG and makes sense. BLG, Elk continuing to pop off and provide that firepower down the bottom lane. I don't think we have even once mentioned Elk when we are talking about BLG and how fantastic things have been. Pretty easy to see why when you look at the rest of that lineup and what has been going on. But you cannot mistake the damage and the skill that's still coming through from your boy Elk in the bottom lane. And this is an 11 and one BLG that I've heard people, everyone saying Bin isn't really in the best form right now. And they're 11 and one, the top team in the LPL. So they still haven't reached that ceiling with Knight in this lineup. So yeah, this is still an absolutely terrifying team in the LPL. And Gen G remains maybe less so now, but what does this team have to do to get the respect that they deserve? They even 2-0 T1, and it's more like, wow, T1, that wasn't very good. How about some praise for Gen G? I'll just lay it out. The non-believers, that's all it is. It's going to be the non-believers. Those are the only ones that you're left to convince, and all you're going to take to convince them is success internationally. An MSI title, a world title, that would be it for an organization like Gen G, for players like Chovy to get that type of un unanimous respect is what I'll say and the deserved respect for them. But right now, it's just the believers like you and I and the rest of the Gen G fan club out here talking about how fantastic they have been. This really is a team that has risen to the top of their potential and what they can show us right now. Obviously, a player like Chovy in the mid lane and how dominant he can be within his lane. You have Keen rising up to the very top level of the top laners in the LCK, besting someone like Zeus. And he says, I'm, not only can I take it individually, I've got backup to make you the bigger hole for you to lay down in for your grave. This is a Gen G team that has got the firepower and they are rolling. Three new members come in and they don't miss a beat as the defending champions. How about some respect for that one? They deserve that top spot right now. But that's it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you. Beautiful people. Thanks for hanging and we will catch you.